Well, I hope you had a pleasant trip to Amsterdam. And uh, I'm going to uh, present some part of my rec recent research regarding uh, identification of uh, potentially harmful requests and reporting them, of course. And uh, I'm going to say uh, in the beginning that I'm sorry, but I'm going to discuss slightly a bit of graphs, uh, not even graph theory, but uh, I've noticed that any time uh, I speak about graphs, uh, in most of people's minds, something turns and they just switch off. Uh, they say, well, it's definitely black magic. I don't want to have anything to do with it. <coughs> so uh, please bear with me. It's going to be very simple and uh, hopefully understandable. And so uh, let's start then. Well, probably you are all well aware about uh, the state of internet security, but just to uh, put some numbers uh, down to it, uh, there are some reports uh, from recent years uh, that state that well, there are companies that do penetration testing and uh, report them, or at least report some summary findings. And uh, the three uh, reports that I had found uh, recently were from Ivy's Whitehead and Symantec, and all of them claim that uh, well, the majority of websites uh, are vulnerable. But if you went to uh, the keynote uh, presentation uh, just an hour ago, uh, you probably noticed how easy it is to make a wrong website. So that's uh, no news. But uh, the scale of it uh, is really astounding. I mean, 70, 80% of websites vulnerable, that's just really amazing. Uh, I have a friend uh, who lived in uh, Cairo, in Egypt, and uh, he was also a security guy, and he said the security there was so terrible that you basically had holes in every single application that he uh, touched. And he sent reports, for instance, to mobile companies, uh, explaining to them how much SQL injections they have in their applications. And the answer was, well, so what? Why would anyone would like to abuse it? That wouldn't be fair, right? Uh, so he ended up with uh, finding an exploit that just cleaned his bill, his mobile bill. So he used uh, the mobile phone for a couple of years free of charge. And then he moved to Switzerland. So uh, that's why I can tell the story. Also, uh, Symantec reported that uh, in just one single month of uh, May 2012, one single uh, malware, which is uh, Lisa Moon, was responsible for about a million successful SQL uh, injection attacks. That's, uh, that ha tells us uh, what is the scale of the problem. So, uh, what I'm going to discuss is a method that uh, I have develop, developed to identify certain uh, class of attacks. Uh, of course, uh, we all know that uh, cross-site scripting is probably the most uh, widely spread uh, vulnerability of the websites, but that's not all. So uh, we are not. I'm not going to talk about uh, XSS uh, here. I'm going to talk about uh, other exploits which are based on uh, abuse of path traversal, which. Uh, may consist of multiple attempts to perform some uh, thing and uh, failing during 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 doing so. Uh, forceful browsing, so accessing directories that shouldn't be accessed uh, from normal uh, use. And uh, unusual, unusual usage patterns. And uh, just one more thing came uh, to my mind uh, exactly a week ago. Uh, I was speaking to the dean of my faculty and he said, well, you know, we have recently found a security hole in our uh, online university system. Uh, one of the students uh, that was using the system found out that he can download all the database of all the users of the, our faculty. And actually, he wasn't even exploiting the system. He just was following the links. So he clicked one of the links, and then uh, he got the whole database downloaded. Um, okay, so uh, this uh, 
part one of the uh, presentation, which is related to modeling of the behavior. And this is the first graph that I'm going to show you, and how you can, uh, as you can see, it's uh, pretty easy. Uh, the, um, the slots represent uh, consecutive URLs that were sent to the server, which the arrows connecting them uh, to show which were sent to the server after which. And uh, we have uh, this blue uh, square in the middle, which uh, holds the, let's say, legitimate requests from uh, legitimate users. And we have a couple of uh, attack patterns, as you can see, uh, attempts to access, uh, most, uh, in most cases, uh, PHP my admin, uh, which is, of course, the module to access the uh, MySQL database via PHP uh, interface. And uh, this is basically what uh, this part is about, to identify these uh, attempts which differ from um, daily usage. So my assumption was that uh, with large, large enough uh, sample of data, it would be possible to uh, identify these usual patterns. And then if we have the usual patterns, then of course we can uh, spot the unusual ones because they differ from the usual ones. So uh, if we have the graph and if we just add one to the number to the weight of the edge of the graph uh, every time uh, a user traverses a certain path. Then uh, in a uh, short time we will have a graph that uh, holds the information about which paths are usually uh, are used often at we and which paths are um, very rarely used or just once. And this is uh, an example from my website. As you can see people who come to my website, uh, go to different places, and uh, it was collected over a couple of hours, probably, uh, as far as I remember, and they uh, go from, as you can see, from one place to another, and back and forth, and sometimes they uh, loop on the same page, but uh, this is clearly uh, understandable, I think. Uh, if you don't understand it, then just let me know and I'll explain. This is uh, actually another graph from uh, a bit uh, larger website. And uh, I will show you uh, details in a second. But uh, you can clearly notice that there is a, a cluster of communication between uh, these pages in the top right corner. And this is... Uh, what I would say a legitimate use. So uh, they are downloading uh, a couple of uh, core um, web pages and uh, of course the associated data. And we have uh, several patterns that uh, only uh, that uh, users only go to specific sites. And as you can see, the weight of the graph is one because uh, during this period of time uh, when the graph was built, such uh, transition happened only once. And uh, if you see that uh, graph, uh, it's clear that uh, it's quite easy to identify these uh, attack patterns because, uh, like I said, they ho only happen uh, once in a time. So that's the distribution of... Uh, the weight of the edges, um, the number of transitions that happened between a certain URL and another URL. And uh, as you can see, there is uh, a large number of uh, very rare transitions uh, that happened only once during the period of uh, the time when the graph was built. And of course, we have popular transitions that relate to uh, typical usage patterns. Now, if we just... Uh, keep building this graph and of course uh, we have to uh, also erode it, so remove some weights from time to time uh, because it may change. Then we uh, have a tool that uh, allow us to identify the suspicious requests, uh, so the request that only has one or uh, two uh, occurrences during this time. And we can use it uh, 
for reporting and to notify the administrator that something's going on, or we can probably implement some uh, automated tools that, for instance, will block uh, this certain user for a certain period of time, um, hindering his ability to probe our website. What is the primary benefit of this graph structure is that uh, it can hold a relatively large amount of data uh, within a small data set. Um, large servers tend to produce a uh, huge amount of data. Um, I spoke to um, a man who was working for one of uh, news portals in Poland and he said we produce that much data that we cannot analyze it. It's uh, counted in gigabytes per day. That's, that's the amount of log data that we have. And uh, there are no tools for now that would allow us to analyze it in real time. Uh, so with this graph, uh, you can store a relatively large amount of knowledge, not data, but knowledge, uh, in a small structure. Because uh, the transitions are just increasing the weights of the edges. And it's still one byte or a couple of bytes. Uh, we can report uh, the attempts uh, in real time, more or less. That depends on the strategy that uh, is implemented. And also, that's uh, maybe not related to security, but uh, it's also good beneficial for the websites. Uh, we can optimize the performance by pre-caching the, the, uh, the web pages if we expect uh, the next page that is going to be loaded. Or we can use it to uh, optimize the websites, for instance, to um, rebuild the structure in such a way that uh, the most uh, often requested content is easily accessible within one or two clicks from the start page. What are the problems with this approach that I um, have come uh, across? First, it's not easy to uh, identify the sessions from the pure log requests. Um, the server usually stores uh, the log requests as they come, one after another. And to have um, such graph, uh, we need to have sessions. So we need to know which request come after uh, another. Uh, of course, there are certain me uh, several methods that can be used. One is uh, the use of uh, session IDs. They may not be called uh, SID, but uh, certain frameworks use certain uh, session cookies, session uh, IDs, and uh, so forth. Uh, and we can also use referrer to track from one request to another. Of course, the referrer can be forged, but it is of no benefit to the forger because that abuses the path and make it stand out from the crowd. So uh, it doesn't help. Now, uh, another issue that uh, needs to be addressed is to how to filter out uh, the request made by a user, which is for a certain web page, from the request made by, by the browser once the page is loaded. Because once the page is loaded, then there are a number of references on the page for images, uh, um, cascading tail sheets, JavaScript, and all the stuff that needs to be loaded. So uh, I have implemented some logic for that. Uh, that seem to work uh, well enough, uh, maybe not perfect, but it does separate uh, most of these follow-ups. And uh, there is uh, the last issue, which is uh, how to not be overreactive, because sometimes even legitimate users uh, do tend to um, click something strange. Okay, I'm sorry. And. Uh, uh, for that, uh, I propose we can use something which, which I call just earned, and that is uh, if people or if uh, a user follows uh, a number of uh, transitions that uh, fall into this, let's say, legitimate category, he earns points. Uh, and uh, he can earn a couple of points, uh, and then if something uh, strange happens, that we, then we remove these points from his account. Uh, thus allowing him to do one or two strange things uh, once in a while, uh, but still reporting unusual uh, behavior if it is consistent, if uh, a number of requests uh, are still not uh, falling into this uh, us usual usage patterns, then we can report it as uh, an abuse. 
So that's, uh, that concludes the first part, uh, which is uh, related to uh, the behavioral analysis. analysis. And um, if I would uh, to sum it up in uh, just one phrase, uh, it is uh, very um, perceptive. It can uh, identify uh, almost every single unusual request, but this, it is also, in my experience, overreactive. That means uh, it uh, produces a lot of uh, false positives. Uh, of course, the number is reduced with this uh, trust and uh, add-on, but still uh, it is a considerable amount of false positives that uh, needs to be addressed. So uh, for that, I uh, developed another uh, layer of uh, identification of requests, and that is based on collective assessments of this request between uh, several servers. How it works? Uh, as you uh, also heard in the keynote uh, presentation, there are a lot of uh, people that are hackers. There are, it is uh, democratized. And uh, many people just use ready tools that they download from internet and they just run it uh, like this bishop. And uh, also, there is a lot of malware over the internet, like uh, during the first uh, slide when I uh, showed you that uh, Lisa Moon was responsible for one million injections uh, during one month. So what we see actually is that uh, the same patterns and the same uh, requests for uh, URLs are often repeated between, uh, among uh, several servers. So if the servers can share their information about the request they consider suspicious between themselves, and if they can confirm that uh, exactly the same request arrived at a different server, and I consider it suspicious, and the other server considers it suspicious, that means, well, it's 99% not legitimate. Uh, then we have a tool that uh, reduces or also even eliminates the false positives, but still provide us the information about uh, suspicious requests. Of course, uh, we cannot uh, publish the URLs that arrive at the server because uh, they may contain sensitive data uh, for several reasons. But uh, because the server servers just need to um, confirm their findings, so they find out that the URL is suspicious and would like to uh, confirm that other server received the same uh, request, uh, it is enough to use a hash of an URL because then you have one way um, to encrypt the hash and you cannot decrypt the original URL from it, but you can compare it with your own URL and check if uh, it is the same. Of course, uh, for this comparison, the URL needs to be stripped from uh, specific uh, parts like the server, the domain, uh, maybe the installation path and uh, the arguments, so only this uh, basic um, web page is, uh, is hashed. And uh, here's how it looks in my reference implementation. Uh, when you have uh, the URLs of um, encoded in MD5 and some additional data that is used for tuning, uh, like uh, what is the reason this certain URL was reported. In this case, most of the reports were due to the request being uh, not available at the server if uh, there is a request coming uh, at the server and the server does not have certain resource like this PHP admin uh, at different URLs. Uh, it is also a potential thing to report because uh, that means something is uh, definitely not uh, as it is supposed to be. And we have the age of uh, the access when it happens that might also be used for fine tuning of, uh, of the reporting algorithm. And uh, the C in the beginning is uh, something that I not, don't, do not use anymore, but it means uh, whether the report is forwarded from other 
uh, website or is it originated at this uh, specific uh, place? So uh, here's, here's how it looks uh, and how I build it. Um, unfortunately, or maybe unfortunately, uh, I had to add some uh, specific export rules to um, remove certain requests from being processed uh, because uh, quite often we have uh, requests for things that are very common and missing like uh, favicon.ico. You know what this play, uh, file is? That's uh, the icon of, uh, of the website and many websites uh, do not have it but still browsers request this uh, file or robots.txt uh, as well. So uh, to uh, remove, remove the number of uh, false positives, yes, I know, I'm approaching <laughs> the final slide. Uh, to remove this uh, potential not uh, interesting uh, request, they are being removed at the early stage. Then uh, this uh, information about unusual requests uh, that are identified at the website plus the information about uh, the request that generated uh, the missing response are forwarded to uh, the module that uh, checks if uh, it is okay to or not to report them uh, based on the analysis of the graph and uh, by removing this, uh, like I said, usual but missing files. And the list is published um, just by, by the means of a uh, normal web server as, as a web page. And also, um, same list is downloaded from another server periodically from time to time. And then if a uh, certain request is uh, on my list and is on another server list, it is uh, reported uh, to the administrator. Now, uh, that's probably the most interesting part. So uh, I run this... Uh, system for a year on three small, small servers. Uh, unfortunately, I only have access to such uh, small servers because uh, large companies I spoke to were not very keen to give me access to their log files. And uh, in this uh, environment, uh, I was able to detect about 30% of all um, attack attempts. Uh, and this number is low because of this low volume of traffic that was coming to the servers. However, uh, the bright point is there were no false positives at all. So uh, you get a tool that uh, can report some of the attack attempts without uh, the need for prior training and without any false positives, which is of course something that uh, every administrator would cherish because I know I spoke to some that need to come uh, to the office at three o'clock in the morning just to find out that uh, their IDS was overreacting. All right, uh, well that's uh, the conclusion of my presentation and uh, of course if you have any questions I'm happy to answer them. Yes, please. Uh, I will be repeating the questions because that's what I was asked from the organizers so they rec can record it. Uh, so the question is, uh, what happens uh, during the learning uh, phase if uh, there are malicious requests coming from the internet, right? Well, there's no problem because uh, e uh, as long as uh, they do not constitute a major majority of uh, the requests, they will still end up in the graph having very low uh, edge value, right? So, um, and also I clean up the graph periodically. So from time to time, I reduce the weight of the edge, edges. And so uh, the transitions that do not happen, they just disappear with time. And then if something, uh, the same request comes in, uh, say a couple of days, uh, there is no memory of it, so it is also reported as unusual. So as long as uh, the number of malicious requests is low within the whole volume of traffic, 
uh, this is not a problem. Yes? Well, there's no strict rule, but uh, usually if you have, uh, that depends on the, on the amount of traffic. If you have high amount of traffic, probably even a couple of hours is enough. Uh, if you have low, low, low amount of traffic, probably you need a couple of days. So you have, uh, like I said, um, a good ratio because between um, the good requests and the bad requests, and uh, you have all the good requests covered. So if you know uh, how many time you need for the users to basically go through all your sites a couple of times, that's uh, the time of, uh, you need uh, to reserve for the learning. Yes, you had a question. Yes, it, it all looks pretty interesting, but how can I use it? Like if I, if I want to try it at our company, how would I start using it? Like do you have a, a website, a GitHub account? Uh, is it open source? Um, not yet. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm working for a university, so uh, at the moment uh, there's a possibility to get a license for the code, uh, to use it freely. Uh, I'm uh, processing a path to get it open source, so to say, but it requires a certain uh, amount of approval from deans and uh, other uh, officials from the university. So if you want to use it, then please contact me and we'll arrange uh, for that, for you to get the codes, uh, that's it. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, if you restricted the scope to just one site, and would you be able to detect things like forced browsing attempts to bypass access control and things like that? Uh, once again, can you repeat the beginning of. If you restricted the scope to just one website. Um, yes. Yes, that, uh, um, the question was uh, if I can uh, use the system uh, if it is just restricted to one website. Uh, that was the first part of my presentation. Uh, building the graph is uh, just uh, meant to be uh, done on one website. And then you have a reporting on unusual behaviors. The second part, which is the collective detection, uh, is used to reduce the number of false positives. So uh, with the graph, the behavior graph uh, built uh, with just website, one website, you will have the detection of unusual behavior, but you will have also some positive, uh, uh, false positives. Uh, how many? That depends on uh, this uh, trust earned uh, parameter that allows the user to behave unusually from time to time, and of course uh, on the behavior of the user and the number of traffic, which. Uh, larger quantities of traffic, uh, the number, uh, relative number of false positives will be lower. Yes? Yes. All right, uh, so the question is uh, what to do in case uh, when uh, the parameters are used to navigate this website, right? That's what I understand more or less. So, uh, well, um, this uh, method does not address this problem. I did some uh, research with my colleague uh, some time ago on uh, statistical analysis and some other means of analysis of parameters that uh, come with the requests to identify uh, usual and unusual patterns. And uh, uh, as it happens, there, is, there are some tools that can be employed, uh, like uh, I said, uh, character distribution or the length of the parameters and uh, things li like that, uh, that uh, allow us to identify with certain uh, certainty that uh, this parameter is within the expectable limits, but that's uh, outside the scope of this project. Any more questions? Yes, please. Uh, does the chat trace on the website that you do not have to be writing? Because, for example, some e-commerce technologies or websites, they will create a new server of the name if you just uh, do some specific search on the website. And will the intelligence uh, massively writing or will uh, malicious URL? 
All right, so the question is uh, how to employ it to a uh, website that uh, uses uh, URL rewriting for uh, accessing certain pages? Well, uh, that depends. Uh, if uh, the rewriting is done always in the same way, so uh, people accessing next pages get the same uh, rewrites, then it will work. If you get rewrites that are uh, specific for user sessions, so you have some information that is stored in the URL that is related to the session, that it won't work. Yes, there was a question. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. So uh, the question is uh, how this uh, handles the changes to the websites if uh, they change from time to time. Uh, well, this graph adapts. So uh, it uh, grows with the website and uh, it is periodically destroyed. So if the website is uh, more or less the same from day to day, uh, the er erosion of the graph uh, is uh, countered with uh, the inflow of uh, new requests that keep the graph at the same stage. Now if uh, we remove some parts of the website, uh, there will be no requests coming to these certain URLs and this portion of the graph will uh, erode and disappear in time, let's say in a couple of hours or a couple of days, depending on uh, how much traffic do you, do you have. So, and at the same time, uh, you, another part of the graph will grow up. Of course, during this trans transition, you will get a lot uh, of uh, false positives. So the only thing you need to be aware that when you change the website, uh, the graph will start reporting that um, something is going wrong because people will start access new content that uh, has not been yet uh, recorded in the graph. So just for some time you have to ignore the output of the system. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so the question was uh, how to compare the behavior of users at uh, different websites if um, they do certain patterns of the request. Uh, well, this system is much simpler right now, so it doesn't compare patterns between uh, the websites. It just analyzes the pattern requ requests at one website and compares uh, certain single URLs between the websites. So we do not compare, so I do not compare patterns between websites yet. That's uh, not done yet, but maybe a good uh, thing for the future. Uh, yes, it, it is working in real time. I mean, uh, I haven't had chance to, to test it on uh, huge websites, but uh, the implementation is in Java and so I think it can process uh, thousands of requests uh, per second easily at this stage without any optimization. So uh, it doesn't require much uh, processing power. Any more questions? Then thank you very much for coming. <laughs> and hope to see you around. <laughs>